So first of all, I just want to take a minute and um, say thank you to everybody who was able to make the uh, department holiday party yesterday. The end to celebrate endings and new beginnings. This is really a, a great day for us, and I just want to introduce Linda Farkas. I'm going to make you stand up, embarrass you just a tiny bit. Dr. Farkas is our new chief of colorectal surgery. Delighted to get her here from Duke. And it really is the continuation of the development of the Department of Surgery into a more specialty driven uh, activity, taking care of our uh, patients in uh, so many different environments and as we expand to new locations and uh, develop the department in different directions, this really is a great, um, a great step for us. So we're glad to have you here. It's uh, been a long time coming. I think this process started about two and a half years ago, so we're really pleased to have you, so welcome. Um, so again, to uh, expand this really amazing tradition of having our chief residents uh, have an open forum to talk about what they want to and really reflect on their five, seven, eight years where I'm trying not to establish the uh, decade with Dave that happened in Duke and not have it be a decade with Diana, but we're getting closer <laughs> all the time. Um, but I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Erin Brown, which is no, uh, she's no secret to anyone here. Came to us originally from Stanford, uh, Davis medical student, and lucky enough to recruit her to stay here. She's been an outstanding uh, resident serving as our administrative chief resident, which if anybody really understands is one of those honors that turns into a headache. <laughs> but, a, but we really appreciate the work that you've done uh, related to that. Erin will be going to CHOP next year for her pediatric surgery fellowship and has some salient thoughts about her time here. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and in advance for your attention. Uh, as surgery residents today, we often hear stories about the good old days of general surgery training from our mentors. Sometimes these stories sound like the stories our parents told us about walking uphill in the snow with no shoes both ways, but most often these stories often make us think about how much residency has really changed in the last decades to century, and it one makes us wonder, are we really going to be prepared when we're done? As most of you know, this is Dr. Halstead. He was the first chief of surgery at Johns Hopkins, and he was the first person credited with the development of formalized surgical training in the United States. Prior to Halstead, surgical training was largely based on apprenticeship. Halstead put into place a formal surgical residency in the 1890s, and his residency stressed repetitive and intense opportunities to take care of surgical patients. It relied on graded enhanced responsibility and independence, and it was the first to implement milestones for surgical training. Since the 1890s, surgical training has drastically evolved. Residency now extends over a defined period of time, and there are graduation requirements, standardized exams to ensure competency, and for better or for worse, these dramatic changes have brought new challenges to surgical residency. While the difference between residency in the Halstead era and today are innumerable and could probably fill an entire year's worth of Grand Rounds lectures, I'm going to focus on three of the challenges facing general surgery programs today. The first is duty hour restrictions, the second is resident attrition, and the third is child rearing during training. I'll discuss a little bit of the history for each of the topics, the current literature, and contemplate a little bit about where the future may lead. Starting off with duty hours, this phrase was completely non-existent in the Halstead era. In fact, the term house staff officer meant that residents literally lived inside the hospital. Today, those days are certainly long gone, but this is actually a relatively recent change. The formal study of the effect of residents' long hours on performance began just over 40 years ago, when the first study showed that post-call residents made more errors reading standardized EKGs than their well-rested colleagues. By the early 1980s, some internal medicine and pediatric residencies began to incorporate the importance of balancing education and personal time in their residency statements. What really brought duty hour concerns to the national level was the Libby Zion case in 1984. A college freshman, Libby died within eight hours of admission to a New York teaching hospital. 
She died from serotonin syndrome due to inappropriate administration of psychiatric drugs. Her father happened to be an influential newspaper columnist, and he began a campaign that targeted the long resident hours and the lack of appropriate supervision that he felt contributed to his daughter's death. In 1986, a grand jury investigation found that her death was related to the 36-hour call shifts by, worked by the residents involved in her care and due to a lack of inadequate supervision by her attending physicians. The result of this trial was the recommendation for the 80-hour work week, including a maximum shift recommendation for 24 hours. These recommendations were incorporated into the New York State Health Code in 1989, making New York the very first state to regulate resident hours. From this, the ACGME eventually adopted the 80-hour work week, and this was nationally mandated for all residencies by 2003. Listed here are the 2003 duty hour mandates that we are all familiar with. However, due to ongoing concerns about patient safety and a lack of compliance with duty hours, Congress tasked the Institute of Medicine to study the impact of resident duty hours on both patient safety and resident well-being. I'll briefly review some of the literature they, decided in their, their, they cited in their final report. The first study came from internal medicine interns at the Brigham. Interns were randomly assigned to work either traditional Q3 call hours versus a limited hour shift with 16 hour shifts and 60 hours per <coughs> week while they were on their ICU rotations. During their rotations, they were monitored by continuous polysomnographic monitoring to record the number of attention lapses. The study found that residents in the reduced hour group had significantly fewer attention lapses than those in the traditional group. In another study coming from the Brigham, the same internal medicine residents on their ICU rotations were again randomized to the either traditional schedule or the reduced hour schedule. They demonstrated that interns committed significantly more serious medical errors and more non-intercepted serious errors when working under the traditional schedule compared with the reduced hour schedules. When looking at the types of errors, these were mostly related to medication and errors in diagnosis. Lastly, they also reviewed a study of interns nationwide and found that the odds of being in a motor, motor vehicle collision after working for more than 24 hours were two folds greater than the, work, the odds after a lesser shift. The odds of being in a near miss accident were six fold greater. Based on these findings on fatigue and extended shifts, the Institute of Medicine came to the conclusion that human performance begins to deteriorate after 16 hours of wakefulness. It's important to note that they also reviewed a ton of literature on patient safety and found that no conclusive evidence that the 80 hour work restrictions improved patient outcomes. Despite this, their final report was released in 2008 and recommended that in order to improve patient safety and resident well-being, no resident should ever work more than a 16-hour shift unless a five-hour uninterrupted nap was provided. They put the onus on the ACGME to uphold these recommendations. While the idea of a five-hour uninterrupted nap sounds fantastic, I think we all know that this is a little bit more realistic of our naps on call. Nonetheless, the ACGME did adjust their duty hour restrictions based on this report. Based on testimony that interns work the longest hours out of any group of residents, they mandated that interns should not work more than 16 hours and that all other residents should use strategic napping for, uh, for calls greater than 16 hours. They also placed a great deal of emphasis on increased supervision for interns. It's been over four years since the transition to the 16-hour shifts for interns and the 2011 restrictions, and several studies have assessed the perceptions and consequences of this transition. This study surveyed general surgery residents nationwide seven months after the changes were implemented. They found that only 25% of residents were satisfied with these new restrictions. Mid-level and senior residents were significantly more likely to express dissatisfaction than interns. Over 90% of these mid and upper level residents felt that the limitations adversely impacted the education for interns. And the majority of all residents felt that these changes contributed to inadequate signouts. When looking at just the responses from the PGY2 and above residents, 89% felt that there had been a shift of responsibilities from the interns to more <coughs> senior residents. And 73% felt that they were more fatigued as a result of this shift. 
86% believe that there was a decreased level of patient ownership among interns due to these duty hour restrictions. Lastly, it's important to note that only 15% of these residents felt that if the 16-hour limitations were applied to them, it would result in more meaningful time off. In another national study assessing perceptions six months after the implementation, they compared the responses of surgical residents shown in dark gray to non-surgical residents shown in light gray. It's interesting to point out that surgical residents tended to respond more negatively to the restrictions than their non-surgical colleagues, but overall perceptions were negative from both groups. When focusing on the responses from the surgical residents, the majority disapproved of the new guidelines. 62% that while quality of life improved for the interns, 54% felt that it was worse for senior residents. Additionally, most indicated that work schedules, education, and preparedness for more senior roles were worse. <coughs> residents reported increased handoffs, and again, they showed the same shift of junior level responsibilities to senior residents. <coughs> Lastly, when looking at the primary goals for improvement with the new work hour restrictions, residents reported that perceived patient safety was worse there was no change in the amount of rest that they received or no change in the avail availability of supervision. Another study of surgical interns at 11 residency programs had similar findings. The majority of all interns felt that the duty hour changes decreased the coordination of patient care, decreased patient continuity, and decreased time spent in the OR, and less than half believed that they improved resident fatigue. The most interesting findings in this study were that despite restricted duty hours, interns still scored less on mental health surveys when compared with the normal U.S. population. One third of interns demonstrated weekly symptoms of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reported either very poor or not great personal professional balance. <laughs> Lastly, one in seven interns considered giving up their career as a surgeon on at least a weekly basis. Lastly, a meta-analysis reviewing the literature on data, duty hour restrictions separately analyzed the 15 ar articles that focus solely on the 2011 restrictions. Looking first at resident wellness, results were mixed. While 22% of the studies showed some areas for improvement, 11% suggested that wellness was worse, and the majority reported either no significant change or had unclear results. Findings for fatigue were equally mixed and time in the OR was perceived as decreased by the majority of studies. These studies cited resident training, professional satisfaction, a decreased preparedness for more senior roles, and decreased wellness of more senior trainees as the biggest areas for concern. Looking next at patient safety, 79% felt that safety had actually declined and not a single study showed any signs of improvement. Decreased continuity of care and increased handovers were identified as the biggest causes for the decline. Lastly, when examining resident education, the vast majority conclude that education was worsened, and this included both subjective and objective studies. Given the lack of data suggesting improvement in either resident wellness or patient safety, the ACGME joined with the American Board of Surgery and the American College of Surgeons to conduct the first trial. Over 150 general surgery residency programs were randomly assigned to either a control arm that strictly adhered to the 2011 restrictions or the duty hour flexibility arm. This flexibility arm could ignore all of the ACGME rules except for the three listed here. And in fact, 24 hour call shifts were actually encouraged to improve patient continuity. Uh, the primary outcomes for the study are either death or serious morbidity within 30 days. And I think most of you know that we are participating in this study and randomized to the flexibility arm. And this is the second year of the study. Given the prevalence of negative perceptions, many surgeons, both faculty and residents alike, are eagerly awaiting the results of this trial. And many are hopeful that the trial might result in a return to the 2003 duty hour restrictions. However, the issue of resident duty hours has spread beyond just the medical community with significant attention from both the public and the government. These headlines are from articles that I've seen in the Wall Street Journal, CNN, NPR, and even Facebook. With all of this attention, it's quite possible that the 2011 restrictions may be here for good regardless of the outcomes of the first trial. 
Duty hour restrictions are a relatively new phenomenon in re residency training. There are certainly clear challenges associated with their implementation and significant concerns that these restric restrictions have resulted in a change of culture to shift work mentality, have decreased patient continuity of care, and may leave residents unprepared. These findings are worrisome, but these restrictions may be our new reality. Programs that are able to adapt, demonstrate flexibility, and overcome the edu educational barriers will continue to thrive, while those programs that lament about the way things used to be, rather than adjusting, may not be so fortunate. Lastly, the findings of burnout, depersonalization, and overall poor resident well-being, especially among junior residents, are important results that should not be ignored. Which segues nicely into the second topic today, resident attrition. Under the Halstead system, residency was pyramidal. Residents spent long periods of time training with no guarantee of ever becoming a staff surgeon. In fact, only 30% of residents were expected to finish. This pyramidal system was customary all the way up until the early 1980s when Dr. Churchill from Mass General was the first to change this structure. He adopted the rectangular structure that we have today and is quoted to have said that half a surgical training is about as useful as half a billiard ball. He decreased the number of accepted residents with the expectation that all would complete the training. By 1996, the RRC officially terminated the pyramidal structure in lieu of this new rectangular structure. But with this change, a new challenge evolved, voluntary attrition. Voluntary attrition, or residents choosing to leave the program, has been a significant challenge for general surgery programs since the inception of the rectangular structure. Reported rates have averaged around 20% and remain stable for years. This means that one in five residents who start general surgery residency fail to complete the program. If we are matching residents and expecting them all to finish, losing 20% of our resident for workforce can place significant strain on the program. Are we simply selecting the wrong residents? Several studies have looked at residency application variables to determine if there is a way to pre-identify applicants at, risk, at increased risk for attrition. This study from the Mayo Clinic looked at all of the general surgery applicants that they ranked in 1996. Of the 53 residents who matched, most were either chief or senior residents at the time of the study. Twelve of them had dropped out over various years, most commonly during their intern year, and all had entered a different specialty in medicine. The authors compared where applicants fell on the rank list for those who quit versus those who did not and found that those in the top 16 spots were actually the ones who were most likely to quit. This next study looked at the relationship between attrition and both the type of medical school as well as ethnicity for a national cohort of surgical residents starting in 1993. First looking at the type of medical schools, they found that rates of attrition for international medical graduates and osteopathic graduates were significantly higher than the rates for United States and Canadian medical grads. On the other hand, ethnicity was not a major factor in attrition, except that African American males had attrition rates that were nearly twice that of Caucasian males. Again, 81% of these residents who dropped out of surgery enrolled in other medical specialties, and most often left due to lifestyle concerns. Another study looking at residents matching to UT Southwestern over a 10-year period evaluated applicants based on age, gender, class rank, whether they got C's on their transcript, whether or not they received a merit scholarship during medical school, whether they played team sports, and the number of superlative comments in their dean's letter. While many of these uh, variables had significant findings on univariate analysis, only four retained significance on multivariate analysis. Being older than 29 years of age, receiving a merit scholarship, a lack of part participation in team sports, and fewer comments in the dean's letter all predicted higher rates of attrition. Again, the trend among those who left was that they left for lifestyle reasons and most often joined another field of medicine. So far, we have not seen any obvious red flags on residency applications, so what about performance during residency? Does this predict attrition? This study of 11 years of data from six West Coast institutions evaluated whether residents placed on remediation had higher attrition rates. Of the 55 residents who left their programs, only two left due to failed remediation. Overall, remediation was not a predictor of attrition. On univariate analysis, the only predictor of attrition was a lower absite 
but only during the PGY3 year. So what about gender? Another common stereotype is that women are at higher risk for attrition than men. Several studies have shown that attrition rates for women are higher than those for men. And you can see that there are some marked differences in attrition rates in these studies. However, these findings are definitely limited by the fact that three out of four are single institution studies, and the fourth study was data collected between 20 and 30 years ago. For each of the studies that have shown an association with gender, there is an equal number of studies that have shown no association. Of the studies shown here, two of them are large contemporary national studies. Taking into consideration all of these, it's no definite association between female gender and increased risk for attrition. However, it's certainly possible that the trends seen at the individual programs are real findings within that specific program. Another interesting study assessed how often residents thought about quitting. Overall, 58% of residents seriously considered leaving their training, most often during their intern, second, and research years. The most frequent reasons residents cited for wanting to leave were sleep deprivation on a specific rotation, an undesirable future lifestyle, and excessive work hours on a specific rotation. When asked what kept them from quitting, most residents cited support from family and significant others, support from other residents, and just the perception of being better rested. On multivariate analysis, only female gender was significantly associated with serious thoughts of leaving residency. I distinctly remember sitting next to Dr. Holcroft during the meeting when this was presented and him leaning over and telling me that this was obviously just because women were more in touch with their thoughts and emotions. <laughs> Nevertheless, the study did show that women were more likely to continue having serious thoughts of quitting residency um, as residency progressed, and this continued even throughout their final year with about a third of female chief residents still seriously thinking about quitting. So what about child rearing during training, another common stereotype? We performed a retrospective review of data from 10 classes of UC Davis residents to determine whether those who had children during training were more likely to quit the program. We found that men and women who had children were no more likely to quit than their peers, but we did see some interesting findings um, and differences in patterns of attrition by gender. While there was no difference in the overall attrition rates by gender, most women left after their intern year while most men left after their research year. On multivariate analysis, the only finding predictive of increased attrition was being single. So we have yet to identify any real consistent findings that predict which residents quit based on residency applications or residency performance. We have seen that they seem to leave for lifestyle reasons, but what exactly does this mean? Why are residents really leaving and what for? This study of over 6,000 general surgery residents nationwide found that the majority of residents who left general surgery pursued non-surgical residency, particularly anesthesia and radiology. Only 13% left for surgical subspecialties. This study also found that rates of attrition were highest in the first, second, and research years, and that PGY year was the only predictor, uh, independent predictor of attrition on multivariate analysis. Another nationwide study of interns and second year residents found that the only variables associated with higher rates of attrition on multivariate analysis were being an intern and interestingly being in a program that was located outside of the South. Program size, number of affiliated fellowships, gender, ethnicity, marital status, children were all non-predictive. More importantly, the study also found that those who quit more frequently reported that they had considered leaving their training program that the personal cost of training was too high, that they were not committed to completing their residency, and that they were dissatisfied with their operative experience. Other responses on the survey indicated high levels of burnout and depersonalization for those residents that quit. Another national study examining why residents left their program showed that program directors most likely cited personal reasons, work hours, and lifestyle as the primary reasons that residents quit. The vast majority of residents cited that the nature of surgical practice was the primary reason they chose to enter surgery in the first place. However, 76% cited lifestyle and 35% cited workload as the primary reasons for leaving. 
So if residents are leaving due to lifestyle concerns, perhaps introduction of duty hour restrictions may have positively impacted attrition rates by reducing workload and allowing for a more positive work-life balance. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be the case. This study showed that attrition rates pre-80 hour work week were no different than those post-80 hour work week. It's important to note that the proportion of residents citing work hours as the primary reason for leaving did not change significantly after implementation of the duty hour restrictions. From what we have shown, the most consistent finding in research on residency attrition is that residents leave for lifestyle factors. Unfortunately, these lifestyle factors are poorly and variably defined. We also see that the highest risk of attrition is early in residency and that residents who quit demonstrate higher levels of burnout and dissatisfaction. So are we not preparing our medical students for the realities of residency? I would argue with anybody that surgery is the best job in the world if you only work from seven to five, you have holidays and most weekends off and you don't have to take call. So how do we better our me mentor our medical students interested in surgery? Or perhaps the better question is how do we mentor junior residents as they transition from medical school into sur uh, surgical residency. While I think some attrition is inevitable and possibly even for the best, improving wellness, camaraderie, and well-being for residents may better support our interns and thus benefit the entire department. But more research investigating how to do this is very much needed. <clears throat> Before we start our third and final topic, I'd like to ensure everybody that <laughs> Despite the apparent pregnancy epidemic in our residency program this year, pregnancy is not contagious. Um, but rates of child rearing during training are certainly increasing. And given that female surgeons did not even exist in the Halstead era, child rearing during training was definitely not a significant concern. The demographics of surgical residents have certainly changed since Halstead's time. Now approximately 40% of medical school graduates entering surgery are women. And if you need proof of the abundance of women in surgery, just look at our second year class. What's important to note is that the average age of medical school graduates is increasing, meaning that surgery residency coincides with prime childbearing years for many residents. Despite this, traditionally women surgeons have elected to delay childbearing until after training. Learner and colleagues surveyed board certified urologists in 2007. They found that women urologists had less children and were eight years older at the time of first birth than the national average. Most concerning was the need for assisted <laughs> reproductive technology was nearly 10 times more likely among urologists than the national population, and the rate of pregnancy complications was 25%, a prevalence greater than that in the lowest income bracket in the United States. And these findings are not just isolated to urologists. A study published just last year Women in general surgery and surgical subspecialties were surveyed, and the data was compared to the CDC National Survey for Family Growth. 32% of women surgeons reported difficulty with fertility in comparison to only 11% of the general population. Women surgeons were also significantly more likely to seek fertility services and use assisted reproductive technologies to attempt pregnancy. Other important findings was that the age of first pregnancy was over 10 years older than the national average. In a study performed by our very own Dr. Troutman, she showed that women surgeons were more likely to be childless and have less children than their male peers. Is this just a characteristic of women surgeons that they are more likely to choose not to have children? Perhaps in some instances, yes, but literature has also shown that the rates of undesired childlessness are higher among women surgeons. We also know that female medical students are more concerned about maternity leave and family flexibility than their male counterparts. So it may be that these findings are just an unfortunate consequence of career choice for female physicians. So given the known risks of infertility and higher complication rates associated with delayed child rearing, why do women surgeons delay child rearing until after training is finished? This cross-sectional survey attempted to assess this very question. The survey was administered to residents across all specialties from 11 residency programs. Significantly fewer women than men plan to have children during their residency. When asked to rate their degree of concern on a scale of 1 to 5 that having children would extend their residency training, result in a loss of fellowship position, result in pregnancy complications, or interfere with career plans, women had significantly higher scores than men for all four items. 
signifying that women had a greater belief for the potential of pregnancy to threaten their career. Not surprisingly, residents with higher perceived threats to career were less likely to plan for having children during training. In addition to perceived career threats, the stigmatization of child rearing during residency has also been reported. This study surveyed all female members of the ACS and the Association of Women Surgeons and analyzed all responses based on cohorts uh, since the number of years since medical school graduation. This figure shows that both male residents and faculty were frequently cited as negative influences in the women surgeons' childbearing decisions. It's also important to note that residents and faculty of both genders provided negative influences across the board and that the number of negative interactions with female residents and surgeons seems to have increased in the most recent cohort. When looking at the number of positive influences, the good news is that these seem to have increased for the most recent cohort of graduates. These positive influence were most likely to have been exerted by women residents and faculty. However, the number of negative influences is still significantly higher than the number of positive influences. Lastly, when asked whether or not they agreed with the statement, pregnancy during residency is stigmatized, three-fourths of women surgeons who graduated over 30 years ago agreed and two-thirds of the most recent graduates still agreed, indicating that stigma is still here. Despite these findings, the same study showed that the incidence of child rearing during training is most definitely increasing among women surgeons. Across all cohorts, women were still most likely to wait until training was done for first childbirth, but the percent waiting until completion of training is decreasing among most recent cohorts. Additionally, if you look at the most recent cohort to graduate, Starting around the second year of residency, the percent having children begins to increase in comparison to the older cohorts. This survey of UC Davis residents over a 30-year time span also demonstrates this apparent residency baby boom. The early cohort or those training in the pre-80 hour work week is shown in dark gray. While one third of male residents in this cohort had children during training, only 6% of women did. Looking at the later cohort, or those residents training in the 80-hour workweek era, you can see an increase in the percent of men having children, but you also see a marked increase in the percent of women having children, from 6% all the way up to 35%. When respondents ha who had children during training were queried about factors that impacted their decision to have children during residency, most cited cost of childcare, work schedule, and work hours as negative factors impacting their decision to have children. Support from the residency program was the most common positive influence. In another study from UC Davis, we looked at a 10-year cohort of general surgery categorical residents to characterize child rearing during training. 32% of the male residents shown in blue had children during training, and 25% of the women had children. For both men and women, the most common years for childbirth were during research and during their final year of training but you can see that both men and women had children throughout the entire residency. One of the primary concerns for women was that having children would extend their training, but in our study we found that of the nine women having children during training, only one extended residency and only by two weeks. The remaining residents completed residency on schedule. Not surprisingly, the women on research shown in the red took longer maternity leaves than those taking leave during clinical years. So what about clinical performance? Is it true that child rearing during training negatively impacts per per performance? We compared residents having children during training against those who did not, using total number of cases at graduation, board pass rates, and the percentage obtaining a fellowship position as clinical surrogates for clinical performance. Looking first at the women, we saw no significant difference in the number of case numbers or board pass rates. Interestingly, we saw that women who had children were significantly more likely to pursue fellowships. Looking at the men, there were no significant differences between the two groups. So at least at our institution, having children does not appear to be associated with a worsened clinical performance. However, there are plenty of arguments against having children during training. In full disclosure, being a mother and a surgical resident is probably the best but also the most challenging thing I've ever done. I'll let you know in about eight weeks how being the mother of two kids as a surgical resident is. Um, in all honesty, it comes down to the phrase that everybody just says when discussing when the ideal time to have children is, there is no best time. 
As we've heard, delaying child rearing after, until after training has significant risks, especially for women. It allows for increased financial stability and more control over work hours. Child rearing during training may improve the odds of successful conception, but it also brings along the challenges of balancing an already stressful job with the stress inherent of being a parent. Oops. My choice is quite obvious, but if you need further proof that child rearing during training is both prevalent and possible, take a look at some of the residents in this very room. I'm sure that all of the residents here can give innumerable examples of both the challenges and the joys associated with having children during training. I'm also happy to announce that we have new, three new babies brought into the residency family just last week. Linda gave birth to two healthy twin boys and Sterling welcomed his baby girl. It's important to realize that the negative influences and stigmatization surrounding child rearing during training remain prevalent today. With an increasing number of women entering surgery and the knowledge that female medical students are more likely to consider family flexibility when choosing residency, these issues are important to address and will only become more so in the future. The decision to have, child rearing, uh, to have children during training versus delaying is an extremely personal one but our department is proof that the decision to pursue child rearing during residency can be accommodated and supported without a negative impact on training. Residency today is undoubtedly changed from training in Halstead's era and even from surgical training just a few decades ago. Duty hour restrictions mean that residents must learn the same, if not more content in a limited period of time. Rates of burnout remain high, contributing to persistently high rates of attrition and medical students and residents today are continue, continue to strive for a work-life balance that more commonly includes balancing children during training than ever before. I believe that a culture of adaptation, flexibility, and support will be key to overcoming these challenges while still preserving the quality of surgical training in the United States. Last but not least, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention and also the last 11 years of my training in education. Can't believe I've been here for that long. Um, I could not have done it without the support of the program, the support of my co-residents, um, or the support of my family. Well, Erin, as usual, you do everything with rigor and grace. So. Thank you very much for that really um, detailed and thoughtful um, analysis of where we are. So what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a straightforward answer, otherwise there wouldn't be this many studies looking to try and find a solution to a problem. Um, I really think being flexible um, is part of the key. Um, I think this program does that exceptionally well, but I know from meeting other residents from around the country that's not necessarily the case. Um, but I think it's the key to all three of the issues that I talked about. Um, you can't necessarily control what restrictions and limitations are imposed upon us. I think um, oversight from the government and the public is here, uh, whether we like it or not, and rather than try and fight it, um, we need to accommodate. We have some time for questions. Dr. Galante. A very nice presentation. You uh, are very modest in that you're involved in many of those studies that you have looked up that just your <laughs> So this question is highly debated, and it might sound cold coming from the program director, but is attrition a bad thing? I mean, it's got a negative connotation when you read these studies about attrition rates and how high attrition rates are. But is attrition bad? Not necessarily. I think that oftentimes attrition is a product of people not making the right choice. Sometimes I think that it's because they didn't know exactly what they were signing up for. I think we could do better in that regards. But sometimes it's just that surgery is the wrong fit and it's better off for those people to enter whatever field they're meant to be in. The problem is the fact that it does put an undue burden on the residency program and it's often difficult to accommodate those. I yeah, I, actually, I, I had a, it's almost the same question, but a different point of view. So, you, so twenty percent attrition sounds bad and everything, but really, how does that compare to the private sector? 
for instance, you know, our residents are in their mid to late 20s, early 30s, just out of grad school. Uh, yet when we look at our colleagues who go into uh, finance or teaching or uh, corporate law, the expectation is they're not going to be there for three or four years mm -hmm. as they're going to change their career path. So our, our, do we have too high expectations uh, for our residents? We might. That might be part of the problem. I think that trying to compare attrition rates from residency programs is a little bit different. Most of our, you know, counterparts, our friends from college that have entered other careers didn't invest significant financial and personal time in four years of medical school to then pursue a different specialty. Um, I think sometimes switching to the the field that they're meant to be in is the right thing. But part of me wonders if we're not appropriately training our medical students to allow them to make the right choice so that they can just go through um, without having to switch, without the struggle of trying to change programs or reapply and add more years to an already long process. Dr. Versi. Great talk, Erin. I was curious about the papers you looked at on socioeconomic status and presence of family and geographic Residency. None. There is no literature at all about geographic. There's a great paper. There is. <laughs> I did not find it. I will look for it. <laughs> when I was in Miami, the, the medical students were basically on call every third or sixth night. I came here and they were on call. Our, our, our service days a couple times a month at uh, best. So my question is, you mentioned about preparing them for the, the rigors of surgery. Is this medical program in which they were trained having to do with the uh, attrition later on? In other words, they seem like it seems to me like a more realistic um, exposure to a surgical life that would be the program with that before, as opposed to here, which seems to be less rigorous. I didn't find anything that compared the actual location or the amount of call that they took as medical students, that whether that was associated with attrition or not. Geographic differences, yes. So people apparently coming from the south had lower rates of attrition. I don't know why that is the case. Um, but that was the only geographic finding that I saw. Lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> did any of these studies actually follow the people who uh, did um, quit and go to another specialty, did they follow them longitudinally to see if they were actually happy in their next career path? No, which I'm also curious about, yeah. whether people were just unhappy. not happy in their career to pursue medicine, period. And but isn't it the fun thing about starting to do a study in something that it just generates more questions and mm -hmm. you want to know the answer to the next thing? Do we know how surgery compares to other subspecialties, like our 20% of medicine residents switching and 20% of ER and 20% of radiology and things? Rates for surgery are higher. Mm -hmm. So you might anticipate that with increasing work hours and things like that, the attrition rate might actually go higher. Um, perception being that when we all started, we thought of surgery as like more of a calling than a job. And so people had a different kind of commitment. It was like a commitment, sort of, at least in our minds. Whereas with the prevailing sense that there's a shift towards shift work, and less attachment to the patient, it becomes more like a professional and doctor is alluding to. And then you can maybe have the idea that there might be more attrition than that. <coughs> this is a counter argument. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is I completely disagree with you that there's not something in the water. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's both. I think both are equally important. I think um, perceptions of support from both your colleagues and the faculty are probably equally important. Um, and that if there's a problem with one and a perceived lack of support from one or the other, it's still going to be a big negative factor. Um, if you noticed, a lot of the studies about child rearing came from UC Davis. Um, 
which I think we are a very unique program. Not only are we a larger program, so we're better able to adapt when people go out on leave um, to make it less burdensome for those who are covering. Um, but I also think we've had a long history of both being a female-friendly program, but also a family-supportive program. And I think that we continue to draw residents that that's important to them. Um, and I don't think that how things are here is the way how things are everywhere else. So. Great talk here. Given your, your, you know, what we've learned in this, so let's say you're given the opportunity to change one thing in our program that, that from your experience of the lot of our, our search for residents, what would it be? I, I think that we do a great job of making those improvements as we go along. I think we're blessed to have a program that actually listens to our feedback. Um, having lived through the 2011 restrictions when it first started, I completely agree that there was a shift of work from what the interns used to do to the mid and upper level residents. By the end of our third year, we were all exhausted, but we brought up suggestions, things were changed, and it was better. Um, I think that sort of flexibility is key, um, and having gotten to experience that, I think that that would be something I would bring to any other program that I were to join. Um, I don't think there's anything glaring that I would say, other than maybe a better, more realistic experience for our medical school our medical students rotating on surgery. I think sometimes we do a little bit of a disservice to them by how little call they actually have to take. So, also I would say it's a great talk. I think the sort of sociology uh, behind some of these um, uh, issues is, is very interesting and very relevant. So that the Libby Zion case, which is gosh, almost 30 years old now. Um, it's fascinating because um, the message out of that was duty hours, but that was really such a minor, if any, component of it. Mm -hmm. um, the patient had very serious uh, substance abuse issues. She was the daughter of a very wealthy and prominent uh, newspaper um, person who obviously had a huge agenda in driving. The duty hours really wasn't the main issue, lack of supervision. A uh, patient had many substance abuse issues, which triggered this interaction, which was kind of used for cocaine and was given, you know, serotonin, the uptake inhibitors, and the monoamine oxidase, which is like from years ago, triggered her, you know, uh, death spiral. Um, and the supervision really got buried under the, the, the carpet a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, the patient was never seen by anyone above an intern for two or three days while she was in the hospital. Um, similarly, the uh, Institute of Medicine report, which actually has now been renamed the uh, Academy of Medicine, and, and our chair is, is a member of that prestigious organization. In their report, which you referenced, they called for more studies of the whole issue of the trade-off between duty hours and handoffs and, and the lack of data that really show benefit or maybe even worsening of outcomes with um, uh, more handoffs. Um, but this first trial, and there's an, an internal medicine mm -hmm. trial that's gotten huge negative publicity um, uh, because of, again, sort of, you know, how the issue gets played out in, in, in the public. So it'll be interesting. That, that, that study's going to be reported, the outcomes of the uh, Academic Surgical Congress in, in February. Um, the results are going to be reported. So how many people are going to that meeting Do you, uh, already? Do people have plans to be going to that? It'll be I do think that that's going to be an important place that's presented. Ho Fan, I want you to address the issue of our medical students. Yeah, so as our the, fearless leader in that like regard. The residency with the uh, out of duty hours mentioned in this. Uh, the medical uh, students also work out of have work out restrictions, and but that is mandated by the LCME. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's we are not unique uh, that our medical students can't take a lot of the night call. Is the work out restriction is it's just like a into workout restrictions, so they can't work more than 16 hours shift. They have to have at least 10 hours of rest between shifts, and no more than 80 hours per week. And if they do a night shift, they can't do more than uh, five consecutive night time, uh, night shift, uh, time shift. So it's not uh, unique uh, in this medical school. That's mandated. Mm -hmm. So for us, if we can have them do uh, night calls, but they just can't be here at night time, at daytime. So the, the choices are, do they, can they, should they be here during the daytime or should they be here during the nighttime? And, and we think it's best that they're here during the daytime. And they take some night calls on the weekend because 
doing the daytime on the weekend, they can miss the daytime activities, so they won't miss out. So that's where the, the, uh, the few and a number of calls is coming from. So Sorry. yeah, they, uh, they will face the same challenge as the as the so, so. I do think that we uh, owe it to you, Aaron, having put together all this work and having been here both as a medical student and a uh, resident to have us look again, put together a small task force to just think again with a bunch of different perspectives on how we might do something different with the medical students since that's really one of the things you identified. So <coughs> we will commit to doing that. <laughs> All right. I think we could go on a long time. This is a very <laughs> provocative talker. Really great. <laughs>